In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, I have mercy. Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. gather in the name of your Son to learn for one another. Keep our feet from evil paths. Turn our minds to your wisdom and our hearts to grace, revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome to Augsburg, and we give thanks for your presence here today. And if you're visiting with us, please let us know how we can share with you in your faith journey. We keep our youth in prayer this morning as they make their way back with their adult advisors from Luther Rock. They've had a great weekend and they're on their way home now as they are ready for naps this afternoon, but we're thankful for that time together and we lift them up in prayer not seeing them this morning. This is a busy time in the life of the congregation and I just wanted to draw a few things to your attention. First, Wine and Word continues this Tuesday evening and all are welcome. The Tuesday Bible study continues on Tuesday afternoon, and that is something that all are welcome to as well. And Pastor Joe will soon be sharing a Bible study that he'll begin uh, later on in October. We're excited about that. And then also to draw your attention to the Salem Bach Festival, which is taking place here in town this weekend, including a Vespers here Friday evening at Augsburg. 
We were prepared to share in a congregational meeting this morning to conduct in some brief but important business, but in order to make sure that we had all the numbers and details right, we've needed to just postpone that by one week, and we will hold that at the conclusion of next week's worship service. We're glad you're here as we worship God. Our service continues as we hear God's word. A reading from Amos. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the aphis small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. The word of the Lord. First Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Jesus Christ, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The word of the Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him. 
that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking away this position from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people will welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, and how much wheat do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when that is gone, they may welcome you into their eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you who have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you who have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of the Lord. As the congregation seated, I invite my young friends forward for just a few minutes for a children's sermon. Calling all kids. Anybody want to come up today? Zoe? Bobby Eleanor? You guys want to come up? So he's going to come with Mama. Okay, good, good. Come on up, friends. We had a lot of kids earlier today, so... Yeah, you want to come sit right here, Zoe? And Eleanor and Poppy are coming, too. All right. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see you all. All right, as you're coming up, can you all look behind me? Can you look behind me? Do you see anything behind me that is beautiful? What do you see behind? Do you see anything behind me, Zoe, that's beautiful? Is there anything up there that's beautiful? The window is very pretty, yes. What else do you see that's beautiful? The cross, that's pretty as well, yes. It's beautiful to glorify God. See anything else? What's on either side? There's a pair of them. There's a lot of them. They're really pretty. The flowers, that's right. Every week in church, except for just during a certain time of the year, we always have flowers in church, and they're very beautiful every week, and we're thankful for the florist who puts those together, and they bring them, and they have special vases that fit in those beautiful brass vases. It all works every week. Now, what do you think we do with those pretty flowers at the end of church? What do you think? Do you think we just leave them there to, to just get old? No, we don't do that. You water them. We, we water them, yes. What do you think? Well, it would be a little hard to plant them because these are not necessarily the species that do best in this area. So, but, but that's a great idea. You know what we do? On Monday mornings, we have some volunteers at church, and they take these flowers to other people. They take them to people who are sick or who've had a surgery. They take them to people who can't come to church for some reason or another. They take them to people who are lonely or sad. And what do you think happens when they take those flowers to people? They do. They're happy, right, because they're reminded that their church loves them and that these flowers are a reminder of that. And that's something very special. And we try to to share that with as many people as possible. And grown-ups, if you know somebody who might benefit from that, always tell a pastor. But we try to share that. So... Even though the original purpose for these flowers is to make our church look pretty on Sunday, they have another reason for them too. And just before you go back to your seats, here's what the other reason is for. God uses things lots of different ways. 
God uses things lots of different ways. And so just as God used the flowers for the service, we can use them again and again. And that's something we'll talk about today in the grown-up sermon as well, that God uses things in ways that we would never imagine, but God can still allow all the beauty of this world to make people happy and to remind them that they're loved. Can we remember that? Okay, let's say a prayer before we go back to our seats. Good morning, God. And thank you for all the beauty you create. Help us to share your love with everyone we see and that these flowers may bring joy to all who need your love. We love you, God. Amen. Thank you all for coming up. You can go back to your seat. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There is a man who is well known throughout many generations of our culture, who is now known as one of the most popular, successful, and wealthy entertainers of a generation. His means is not television or movies, it's not music, it is social media. And he has over 120 million subscribers on YouTube. 120 million different people who have bothered to watch his content and tell somebody that they did, much less all those who do and don't mention it. 120 million subscribers. That's about 120 million subscribers more than we have on our Augsburg channel, but <laughs> we're proud of our three-digit number nonetheless. Now his mother and the IRS know him as Jimmy Donaldson. But the world and his subscribers know him as Mr. Beast. You might have heard that name before or seen his name on a list of successful or wealthy people and wondered, who is this man? But Mr. Beast has nothing to do with scary beast-like qualities, but rather just the intensity of his vibe and his action. And he's often seen in his YouTube and TikTok videos going around and sharing wealth and surprising people with Xboxes or all sorts of different things. He sets up lemonade stands and gives people money when they come to the lemonade stand and then instead of them paying, it's, it's all sorts of just silly stuff, but it's what people are interested in. And as there may be a subscriber or two in my house who watch this content, I've sat with them and watched and, and I've discovered that what Mr. Beast is doing is a series of social experiments. He is seeing how money and how wealth drives people to either be more generous or more self-centered or somewhere in between, and that everything he do, does has some sort of secondary meaning to it. It's fascinating to watch. It's also a little bit overwhelming, but it is understandable seeing how a culture and specifically a generation responds to being motivated and the different ways that people are motivated. Now, in one particular about six-minute segment that I watched, Mr. Beast and his cameraman went into a Walmart, and they approached a young man, probably in his early 20s, in the frozen food aisle, and Mr. Beast held out his hand with a wrapped set of cash and said, would you rather have $1,000, or would you rather take this suitcase, which his buddy opens up, and say, and give $10,000 to somebody else. So here he is in the middle of the frozen foods aisle faced with this question, would I rather have $1,000 for myself or would I rather take 10,000 and give it to somebody else? Now, in the first two segments of the video, the first two people that Mr. Beast asked said, eh, I'm in a tough spot, I'll take the thousand bucks, thanks, and they left. But this man decided I'd rather take that 10,000 and give it to somebody else. So Mr. Beast closes the briefcase, hands it to him, and says, walk around the store and find someone that you want to give it to. Hijinks ensue, and they run through the aisles, and they run into a woman and her baby over in the clothing section, and they hand her the suitcase. She asks, is this for real? And they say yes. And then all of a sudden, she is presented with this gift of more money than she could ever imagine, and they are in the middle of Walmart. Of course... Mr. Beast turns to the man who makes the generous gesture of not keeping the thousand dollars himself, but rather giving the briefcase to others and says, and for your generosity, I'll give you the same, and pulls out another briefcase and gives it to him. 
Now, I'm convinced that this might have been random, and I'm sure they have to sign waivers and whatnot, but that this guy knew that if I did something nice, if I was benevolent, and I didn't keep this $1,000, but you know, did more with that, that this might benefit me as well. And sure enough, it did. These are fascinating social experiments, and I don't want you to go down the rabbit hole of watching too many of them, but if you know anybody um, who doesn't yet have the ability to purchase alcohol, they will definitely be able to show you where to find these videos. That's the, <laughs> that's the target audience. This young man knew what he was doing. He had an intellect about him that knew that there would be some sort of benefit. And that's the perfect setup to what we find ourselves in this gospel text today. One that is hard to preach with a word that we don't often hear in scripture, but it's the parable of the shrewd manager. Now let's remember that in this time that the landowners, that those of wealth never engaged with the slaves and the hired hands who tended to their lands, their crops, their animals. They were far off and made sure that any interaction took place for managers in between. And the managers themselves weren't of higher class either. Rather, they were set apart from those who were working in the fields as one who was responsible for them. And so in this parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke, we find a story of a manager who hasn't been doing his job, who hasn't been delivering the results and the yields of the harvest to the owner who owns the land in the first place. And so that master comes to the manager and forces him to take account and to give an accounting of all of his management because in essence, he is being fired. He's been busted for not doing what he's supposed to do. So the manager tries to figure this out and ask, what will I do? And I love this line. I am not strong enough to dig, and I am too ashamed to beg. So the manager here knows that, that he's got to do something different, that he's got to take a different course of action. And what he decides to do is to go to all those who the owner has said, find the people who owe me and collect. And the manager enters into negotiations with them and says, well, how much do you owe the owner? A hundred jars of olive oil. Eh, you know what? Make it 50 and we'll call it a deal. What do you owe? A hundred loads of wheat. Eh, make it 80 and we'll call it a deal. Now, was the manager doing this because he simply wanted to short the owner in his departure? No, not at all. What the manager was doing was in recognition of the fact that he was going to be out on his own without anything, that if he could earn the good graces of those who owned, owed the owner money, that he might benefit from being in better relationship with them. And what does the owner do when he notices that the manager does this? He commends the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. What a mess is this gospel text. Here we have in the midst of a story that Jesus is telling that the disciples are trying to figure out how this parable impacts who they are as followers. And Jesus is talking about one who's being commended for cheating. He's talking about one who's being conniving in the midst of losing their job. And he's talking about that when he's caught for all that, that the one who's in charge commends him for those behaviors. How weird is this? But I dove a little bit deeper into that word shrewd. It doesn't appear too many times in scripture, only twice in the Gospel of Luke, both in this text, and not many times throughout all of the New Testament. And that word shrewd comes from a Greek sense of phronesis. And what that is rooted in is not translated in doing something that is conniving or evil, but those words are prudence, practical virtue, practical wisdom, or colloquially, excuse me, good horse sense, if you've ever used that phrase before. Basically, what shrewdness here in the New Testament is, is not the idea of doing something conniving, but rather doing something that is street smart, that allows you to gain the upper hand. And Aristotle had a lot to say about that 2,400 years ago, as he wrote that while Sophia, wisdom, is the higher calling, and more serious, phronesis is required to pursue both wisdom and happiness because phronesis facilitates Sophia. And then Aristotle goes on to mention phronesis is also a necessary tool for those who want to engage in politics. <laughs> Nothing's changed in 2,400 years. 
But here's the idea of this, right? This ability to be shrewd, this ability to have a sense of street smarts or to know what you need to do is something that is to be commended upon. How often have we heard, this is just one of the most intelligent people that I've ever met, but they don't have a lick about how to live life. They don't know street smarts. Have you met somebody like that? A lot of people exist like that. Extremely intelligent, but not practical in daily life. And this whole idea of phronesis is being able to take a sense of wisdom or intelligence and put it into practice as this steward does in the dishonest uh, manager. So here in the midst of Jesus telling a parable that is all sorts of confusing because we're wondering, wait a second, is Jesus calling us to be dishonest? Rather, we get a better sense of what shrewd means. That shrewd means that we are to understand that we're to take all of the wisdom that we have been given and to apply it in a way that is actually practical and meaningful in our daily lives. Because as Jesus finishes the parable, he tells his disciples, whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. What this means and what we are called to understand is that no matter how much wisdom we are given, no matter how well we know scripture, no matter how deep of a faith life that we understand that there's a practical aspect that comes to it in applying it into the world we live in. And that to engage with this world, which is often doubtful of faith, which is often critical of the things we do, which has stereotypes that center around religion and what we gather to do and what we say about the world around us, that we are called to be smart about it and to take the intelligence and the wisdom, the Sophia that we've been given, and put it into the practice of pronesis, of being able to engage people where they are and to understand how God is working in us. God doesn't call all of us to be pastors or teachers or apostles. We've heard that in other parts of scripture. But what God calls us to do is to use the gifts that we've been given, the street smarts that we've encountered along the way, to engage the rest of God's creation in a world that knows that they're loved. As these flowers, as I told, the children are used for a primary purpose on here on Sunday morning, we use them again to bring joy to someone else. And even though you might have been given a primary purpose of coming together to receive God's word and inspire you in your own life, you are called then to share that with others in the ways that you encounter God's people. Because here's the deal. Much like all those videos that young people watch today, we already know what God is up to. Because that young man chose to go with the briefcase knowing that there was something better inside than the a little bit of cash that was in Mr. Beast's hand. And I'll tell you, friends, we have a briefcase that we have been given, not offered, but given, promised, that is greater than anything that you could ever find in any value of money or ever in any Walmart. It is the gift of life everlasting. It is the gift of forgiveness of sins. It is the gift of baptismal covenant and relationship with God nourished at the table. And if you think about our journey, when we are asked to think about what that means to understand that God has already given us that gift, then we can go and be shrewd for the world. We can go and figure out new and creative and responsive ways to adjust our faith lives to engage with those in the world around us. The Holy Spirit is ever busy and active in our lives, and the Holy Spirit calls upon us to be shrewd, not for our own intentions or gain, but rather so that the whole world might gain the knowledge of knowing Christ's love. Go and be shrewd. Thanks be to God. Amen.
continue together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. As scattered grains of wheat are gathered all together into one bread, we gather our prayers together for the church, for people in need, and for everything created by God. God who journeys with us, your work is done in this congregation with our hands, voices, minds, and hearts. Bless the ministries of this congregation as we serve our neighbors and welcome the stranger in your name. Bless especially this day our youth and our adult volunteers whom we pray have grown closer to each other and to you during their retreat to Camp Lutherock. Lord, in your mercy. God who provides for us, send your peace to be with this hurting world. Bring forth bountiful harvests as the seasons change. Calm the places of this world where tempests and tempers rage. Let peace reign in our world, our homes, and our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God who watches over us, be with those who wander homeless or cry out for bread. Send your love and care to be with all who are struggling with illness or injury. Provide for all those in need and for those we name before you now. Mary Catherine Cashin, Colleen Crozier, Cody Hartwig, Doris Campbell, Marcus Hester, Joanne Ritchie, Barbara Florian, Harriet Cunningham, Roger Knudsen, Chance Weeders, Robbie Brath, Kathy Nelson, Bruce Unger, Sarah Blackwell, Julie Daub, Fran Zaniski, Aaron Dula, Martha Lloyd, Morgan Moore, Linda Bacon, Pamela Barney, Pat Cope, Kathy Liner, Lee Troutman, Marion Apel, Jay Wise, Hank Farrar, and all those we lift up on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, God who entrusts this world to us, guide us in being faithful to you. Bring into harmony the desires of our hearts and the actions of our hands. Where your will diverges from ours, remind us, all we have is yours. Lord, in your mercy, we thank you that you have brought your saints to be with you in your eternal kingdom. We remember Jim Apel, Joyce Kaufman, Angela Ward, Tammy Bowles, Ronnie Wainwright, Joyce Carter, Beth Lynch, Paul Pinto, Jennifer Whitman, Elizabeth Eford, and Lee McCusick. Lord, in your mercy. Into your mighty and gracious hands we offer these prayers and all that remain in our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered, in leading the world with your love. The one who made himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending Mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord. Unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Share the blood of Christ. Reveal yourself to us, O Lord, in the breaking of bread, as once you revealed yourself to your disciples.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.